Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, we're here with Jim Howard. He is the director of the Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Jim, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank I'm you. excited to hear your story. Glad to be here. Um, it was kind of fun because I try really hard not to know everybody's stories before mm-hmm. they get here. Um, I'm a little bit at a disadvantage when I know some people's stories I find. Mm-hmm. so But you did let us in. You've not always been an Adventist. That's true. So I'm excited to hear where um, where and when you find out about the Adventist Church. But let's start at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Where were you born? Where was Jim Howard raised? Sure. Well, I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and I have a big family. Um, so I was the youngest for a period of time, had three older brothers. Um, and then around when I was still just a baby, uh, my parents divorced and then remarried. And so my mom and my stepdad had, uh, a son. And so then I had another brother about six and a half years younger than me. So I was a baby for a good part of the time, but then eventually was, uh, supplanted by another. Um, but I was... Adventist, I guess you could say in the sense that my parents were Adventist, Um, but I didn't go to Adventist schools and um, it was, you know, a warm, loving environment that I have with my family. Loved my mom and dad. Um, My dad could do no wrong. He was very special to me. Um, And then I was very involved in athletics. So I was kind of a, a baseball player growing up. Okay. So you have a mother and father. Did they both stay in Columbus after the uh, divorce? Yeah, it's in the Columbus Ohio area. area, about an hour north and what have you. Um, my family has always been in that central Ohio area. Yeah. Now you said your father could do no wrong. Mm-hmm. So sounds like you have a special relationship with your father. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about your dad. So my dad, um, he was very different from my mom because my mom was very loving, very um you know she was she gave us a lot of attention if i could say it that way um but she was also much uh more high strung i guess my dad was much more calm and collected and i was always drawn to my dad's character and nature and he would you know uh give a lot of time to me in things that I really like to do and that kind of thing. So yeah, my dad just uh, was very special. He could do no wrong for a portion of my life anyway. Um, And ultimately my dad's passed away, um, but he was really kind of the centerpiece of the early childhood period of my life. Now, you said you did sports. Was that something you did with your father? Was he a part of that sport? He was my baseball coach for a period okay. of time. But him and my mom, maybe more my mom than my dad, loved me being involved, especially in baseball, because it was something that I was a little bit uh, naturally built for. And so I played every summer. I was in summer traveling all-star teams every summer. And so my mom would travel around with me. My Dad was very involved too, but he sometimes would have to work and not be able to come along. Um, my dad was, um, he was involved in roofing, involved in a lot of uh, craftsman type of work um, until he, when I was, I'm trying to think of how old I would have been, um, when I was still maybe single digits, my dad uh, was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and some people manage that just fine, but it was a very severe case that my dad had. And so very quickly he was, uh, crippled for me able to do a lot of the things that he would have done. So he got into being a 
car lot manager and salesman and that sort of thing. And that's what he did for much of my uh, teen years and growing up years. Um, and then before long, he was bedfast. Um, and so a lot of years were with my dad were me and mom carrying around the wheelchair, bought a van that could handle it. And, and he was, uh, yeah, he was not real mobile for most of, and he took prednisone, okay, for 25 years. And if you know anything about prednisone, it increases your appetite. And at the same time, he was immobilized basically. So he couldn't exercise. So he gained a lot of weight and it became a very challenging life for him really is, you know, and, and this is, but my dad always had a positive spirit about him. I mean, he would be in, in anguish and pain and we'd be, I'd be talking to him. He'd have a bad day, you know, by four or five o'clock, he's ready to go into the bedroom because he couldn't, he, his energy was gone for the day. And I would, uh, I would see my dad, we'd be talking and he'd be in pain. I could tell he's having a bad day. And then someone would come to the door and, oh, dad, someone's here to see you. And all of a sudden, hey, how are you doing? So glad you're here. And he's talking to them, asking the question, ignoring entirely what he's feeling. And I always love that about my dad, that he just had this ability to make other people feel comfortable and to kind of set himself aside. But he dealt with a lot of uh, pain. And as a result, my mom dealt with a lot of challenges too. She had to be a caregiver for much of her uh, married life. So I love hearing about your parents. Um, and I can see that this... This had a huge impact on your childhood um, because although your mom was a caretaker, it sounds like you in some ways also helped your mom in that caretaking, um, which you can either come to resent somebody or it can teach you to be a much more empathetic person. Mm -hmm. And from the little I've known of you, it seems like it for you, it became the latter. Um, how do you in your ministry today as a or as even as a husband, how has that, those times of watching your parents, um, watching your mother as she takes care, took care of your father, how did that impact who you are today? Mm. Well, I'd say, especially as I got older, I was able to understand things a lot better about, just about people in general, but especially about my own family dynamic. Because my mother, um, she was wonderful, but she worked like you wouldn't believe. I mean, she worked, my dad couldn't work. So my mother was working full time. Um, she was a hairstylist until she got older and then she decided to become a nurse. And so she graduated from nursing when she was 50 years old. And she was working regularly to you know, provide for the family. And then coming home and having to handle things for dad. Um, and that was interesting because I would see the dynamic because it's, you know, it's one thing to do that for a short period of time, but to do that for years, you know, it, it's interesting. My dad, you know, he would hate to ask my mom for things and, you know, my mom would come home tired and she would do things and, um, I would, I would tend to initially sympathize more with my dad because I saw, you know, his condition and how, you know, poor it was and how difficult it was for him to manage everything. Um, but as I got older, I began to see much more of the side of my mom and just how challenging it was to be responsible for all that she was responsible for. And I always played a bit of a peacemaker in my family, even with mom and dad, with all the stress that all this created. They loved each other and had a, you know, um, a healthy relationship in that sense. But there was still a lot of, of tension that's just created by the environment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I learned to, to adapt in that way. My brothers kind of saw that too. They didn't love that about me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I was more of a peacemaker, like, just take a side, just take a side. <laughs> um, but I was always you know, trying to help them see this. And, the, and, and my daughters to this day say that I still do the same thing, that whenever they come to me with some complaint or whatever it might be, I'm always trying to help them see the, see other, the perspective. other perspective. So my kids love that so I much. I know, they love it, don't they? <laughs> so this is just something that I think is kind of inherent in me a little bit from, from growing up in that environment. Um. So I, I'm actually watching my parents 
go through a situation now where my dad is my mom's caretaker. Mm. And I've watched this for the last two and a half years where she's basically been immobilized. Mm -hmm. And I, I do know what you're saying because we often tend to side with that person. We see, we have so much compassion mm -hmm. for the person who has experienced the pain and the mm -hmm. suffering, what they've gone through. But we don't often think about the emotional yeah. and um, mental pain that the caregivers often go through, which I think is, um, I love the fact that the Adventist Church has possibility ministries. And one mm -hmm. of the areas we focus in on are the caregivers. Yes. Because they mm -hmm. are a very underrepresented group of mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that have have given a lot, but they would never do anything less than what they had done. Absolutely. And it's, it's a, it's, I want to call it a beautiful ministry. I mean, it's, it's really just a, you know, a husband providing for a wife and a mm -hmm. wife providing for a husband like they normally yeah, would. Yeah. But, um, it really still is ministry. It's the, it's the taking up the towel mm -hmm. day in and day yep, out yep. and saying, I, I choose to serve you better Makes you think of how ours. many people in our congregations are experiencing it all the time. And I, I think that's such an important thing for us to think about because we can get kind of like lost in that. Um, when, when I, my parents went through the car accident, which is what I watched my church surround even my family mm -hmm. because I went out and spent a month caregiving mm -hmm. and you're right. The church needs to be thinking about who are the other people because it's not always just the spouses. You as a son, yeah, needed to have been ministered to yeah. because in some ways you all are caregivers as well, and right. it's it's a ministry I think that we don't often think about, but is very needed within our churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like we're on such a serious topic, but I, <laughs> I'm going to ask a question yeah. that's going to totally lighten the mood very okay. quickly. So what position did you play on the baseball So field? I pitched. I was a pitcher, a shortstop, and a third baseman. That's okay. where I rotated around. Okay. Yeah. My daughter is a softball player, and she okay. does third base and, and shortstop. So, you know, uh -huh. I, I understand that one very well. If we ever have a GC team, I know. <laughs> no, I want you on my team. I don't know. The so, knees, um, you know, they might not be what they used Trust to me, be. you don't want me on your team, period. But, you know, I'm really really good cheerleader. That's what my oh, daughter said. I am the cheerleader. I come, I used to try to go to every single game I could go to. Uh -huh. And um, the students actually bought me a pom poms. Oh, so wow. that, because like I was the mom. That's of the real the team. deal. Yes, it was. It was great. Um, OK, so you you go through your elementary school years. Mm -hmm. Now, you did not go to Adventist education, not, you said. No. So were you part of things like Pathfinders and all this? Because you said you kind of had this nominal Adventism yeah, kind yeah. of a thing there. So. I'm not trying to skip ahead, That's okay. but you know, later on in my life, when I was in my early twenties, um, I I don't want to give it away too soon, but my parents <laughs> left the church, ended up leaving the church, um, and so later I had to rediscover. And the only things I remembered back from those childhood days, I usually say there's three primary things that I remember. One was uh, I remember that during a Sabbath school class, one of my Sabbath school teachers had a seizure and it was very like, it's like kind of traumatic. traumatic, yeah. I remember that. I remembered us singing around the campfire at Vespers. We had at the local church where we were at, I remember we had a very uh, gifted guitar player and singer who had, you know, put out some albums and things. And so she would lead out <gasps> in the, music and that sort of thing was it patricia white it was oh my <laughs> sorry that's okay i loved patricia okay. white so, so we, much she was in our church and good friends with my parents and so we yeah so we that i remembered that and then the third thing would be i had a bible it was a good news bible you know and if you remember the good news bible they had little sketches mm -hmm. uh, to illustrate some of the stories and stuff and i just Keenly remembered the sketch of Lazarus coming forth from the tomb, you know, and just and, and my little yellow Good News Bible. Um, but I didn't remember any verses from the Bible. I didn't remember any sermons. I didn't remember like any of that. As I got older, you know, it doesn't mean that I didn't go to church and what have you, but that was not. And I don't have the best memory in the world, and I spoiled it a little bit. <laughs> so okay. anyway, the bottom line, <laughs> line is that's that's. You know, I didn't have a lot in terms, and my parents, I would say, they were Adventist and they they were con converts to Adventism, um, and so, yeah, it was. We didn't have like a real solid 
solid Adventist home, but it was, you know, I mean, they, they were believers, strong believers. Um, but when I was around nine-ish years old, uh, my dad um, started studying a lot. Back then, around the end of the 70s, early 80s, was Desmond Ford, uh, uh, was a theologian that started having a lot of influence. And he had studied some of his theology on on the gospel and that kind of thing. And you know, I'm sure this isn't what Ford intended, but he started feeling kind of like, well, I'm I'm saved. I have a relationship with God. I don't need to go to church. And so we moved from Ohio to Missouri when I was, like, it was either nine or ten, nine, nine I think. Um, and once we went to Missouri, I think they may have gone to church once, but then we never went back to church after that. Mm. Moves Moves are hard for people. If they're mm-hmm. already not like sold and committed yeah, and um, yeah. I find that moves tend to be a time where people can very easily get lost yeah. um, in the church shuffle. Yeah, they had a lot of people established in where they were that would have checked on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they were Adventists. But when we moved, it was so that my mother could work in a salon that was co-owned by my aunt and uncle and my uncle was a millionaire and he was uh you know able to fund this salon Mm -hmm. so that my mom saw it as an opportunity she couldn't pass up and so we moved out there but they were not adventists and there was no adventist influence and so for my mom and dad it was an easy thing to kind of slip out so you moved to missouri Mm -hmm. and columbia columbia so you went from columbus to columbia that's right do you live in Columbia, Maryland now? Okay, because no, if don't. you do, I'm just going to say. <laughs> Not nearly as exciting uh, here. Know. Um, all right, so you moved to Col- Columbia, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- is this where you spend your, like, your high school years? Yes. This is kind of like where you do the rest of your childhood. Yeah, up to college. So how how were your high school years? Because yeah. teenage years can be hard anyways. Yeah, so you know when I moved there, I tended to be, you know, I wanted to be a good kid and everything. I did well. Fifth grade, I got in there. They immediately made me president of the class. I felt, you know, so fit in. I fit in well. I love my teacher. All these things were wonderful. In seventh grade, um, I I won the citizenship award for the boy. It was a girl, girl and a boy who won it. And, I, and my friends who I knew started making fun of me for it. And so for being I, too good. Yes. Got so it. in eighth, I have been there. <laughs> so in eighth grade, I made sure that wasn't the case. I started becoming more sort of a class clown and sarcastic and you know what have you, and started my grades started to suffer from it, but I was fitting in with this group of friends that I had, you know, and that was what was important to me. As I was young, that was what was important to me was just I wanted to be liked. Even my brothers and my family, I can go back to when I moved to Missouri and I was maybe 11 or 12, maybe 11 probably. It was right after we moved there. Um, and I, my parents got me a bike for my birthday. And two of my brothers who are older, who I love dearly, but at the time they were a, a nuisance to me, um, just harassed me about being spoiled and everything else. They didn't get ever got a bike for their birthday. Blah, blah. And I remember going into the backyard and just bawling. Like I, I didn't care about the bike. I, and I had an older brother, Dan, Okay, and um, so Dan was my oldest brother. It's kind of confusing because I have stepbrothers, and Mm -hmm. and is a. a, It would take too long for me to explain the whole. So we're not going to go through the whole family family tree. tree. Yeah, (laughs) and there's other events that happen that that would be too complicated. But suffice it to say that my older brother Dan, who was nine years older than me, um, came to the backyard and saw me crying, and he was like, you know, what's what's the matter? And back then I was called Jamie, by the way. I was Jamie. Well, not not that. I was James at that time. So I was Jamie when I was little because that's what my mom called me. And everybody knew me by Jamie except my dad called me Jim. And then I moved to Missouri and I didn't want to be called Jamie anymore because my brothers teased me about Jamie because the only Jamie they knew was Jamie Summers, who was the bionic woman in that particular <laughs> show. So I got all this razzing from them about being... Jamie. And so when I moved to Missouri and they took roll call in class and asked me if I could go by anything but James, I said, no, James is fine. So from that point on, I was James, except for my dad still called me Jim. Okay. So anyway, at this point, my older brother would have called me James. He said, you know, what's the matter? And I'm crying about my other brothers razzing me. 
And I'm like, I don't care about the bike. I just wish that my brothers wouldn't hate me. <laughs> you know, that was like my, my big burden. <laughs> so I was always very sensitive to just wanting people to like me, you know. And so that kind of was the same feeling I had in seventh grade and grow, grow in, in high school. I was just doing whatever was needed to fit in. I was a bit of a people pleaser, to put it mildly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, that was my experience in uh, seventh and eighth grade. And I, I lived in a neighborhood with a couple of guys who had an older, one guy had an older brother who was into all kinds of things that we weren't. And he gradually got us into those things. So I, you know, we, I went to a public high school where there was a party every weekend. It was like that. It was basically my life during that period was a very secular and worldly life. Are you still in sports? Yes, I'm playing sports in high school, playing baseball, varsity baseball, playing in the summers still. Yeah, all of that until I graduated. Okay. So you're involved in sports, maybe doing things you shouldn't be doing on the weekends. Mm -hmm. but For sure. Um, you're, you're creating your conversion story. <laughs> we'll call it that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, although everyone's story is great. Right. Um, so you get through your high school years. Yes. And you decide you're going to pursue a degree in what? So I was really good at math. <clears throat> and so I wanted a job that would pay me good money that I could use math. And so that was engineering. So I got into engineering, um, electrical engineering. And for two years, I went to the University of Missouri. I, want, I had these friends that were like brothers to me in Missouri, where my actual brothers, most of them were now back living in Ohio. My little brother and one older brother were still with me uh, in Missouri, living at home with my mom and dad. So, yeah, I got into engineering, and for two years, I did not put much into it. Um, and so it, my schooling didn't go great. I lived in a house with four other guys. Every weekend was, you know, another party, a buzz of some kind. And so I wasn't really doing real well. I, was, I had a side job to help pay my rent. And so what ended up happening was when I get toward the end of the two years, my grades are not good. And I mean, it's not like I wasn't passing or anything, but I, you need, in engineering, you need a really good GPA in order to get a job, you know, so it wasn't good enough. And I was, and then what happened was I had a, a problem with my knee um, I was sitting in the house one day, sitting against the couch on the floor with my knees bent and I went to straighten my leg and I couldn't, I couldn't straighten it. It was just like that. And so I went to the emergency room and they said, well, we need to do an MRI, but we can't do an MRI until we get your leg straight. So I had to go through a few days of therapy where I go and they spray liquid ice on my knee and I have this thing to try to crank it and to straighten it. Finally, after a few days of working on it, I got it straight and they had given me a brace to, so I braced it real quick, did the MRI and found out that I had a little chip of bone off of my femur that had come loose. It's called osteochondritis, just a knee problem. Um, and they had to fix it. And there were a couple ways they could. They could pin the bone back on there, kind of try to fuse it back. And that would save it from maybe early onset arthritis or they could remove it. And so I said, well, let's try to pin it. So for two months, I was on crutches. My friends were helping me. I wasn't working. So I wasn't, so I was borrowing money to pay my rent. And then at the end of the two months, I feel this clicking in my knee and it was clear that it was not taking. So then they had to remove it. And then I had to go two more months on crutches. And then at the end of that two months, I got a bad uh, strep throat. Now I had had an experience of this when I was younger. My parents didn't have a lot of money. So whenever I got better, they're like, oh, let's not worry about the tonsils. But this time I couldn't even get it better. I'd had abscesses in my throat before and the doctor said, we just got to remove your tonsils. So I've got my crutches, my knee problem, and now I've got my tonsils removed. And meanwhile, during all this, my mother tells me she's living in Ohio. I'm here in Missouri trying to make it work with my friends in this party house. And, and by the way, it's a humbling thing to have guys like that have to take care of you. It's not a good thing. It's bad enough to have your mother or somebody like that who has to carry your plate for you and has to do all those things, but it's even harder when it's your college buddies who are not the most responsible guys in the world. <laughs> so the bottom line is they end up um, 
or my mother ends up checking into it and finding out that I can transfer all my credits to Ohio State and it will not transfer my GPA. My GPA will start over. And even though I did not want to leave and I did not want to leave my friends, I owed this guy money. I had these bad grades. This was going to fix everything. So I ended up moving home to Ohio. That was when I was two years into school. So I went to the Ohio State University. That's I where I went. You. And after one quarter, I did well in that quarter. I got A's, but it hit me. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> like I'm not mechanically, naturally mechanical enough. See, I got athletic ability my brothers didn't have. And I always thought that was, you know, I was pretty proud of that. Until I got older and found out that that's worth nothing when you get older. <laughs> and the mechanical <laughs> ability that they had is worth so much more. It so works anyway, for those few players who it, ever make it into yeah, right, any right, right, major right. league. I but suppose. otherwise, the rest of the people, it's like, yeah, that was great. <laughs> so anyway, that's right. So I uh, ended up deciding to get out of engineering and get into accounting. And I got into accounting, did very well, got into honors accounting and, you know, was able to do very well in that. And I got my degree uh, from Ohio State in accounting, living at home in the basement of my parents' house is where I finished up my, my schooling. Jim, I have no idea how you're going to get us to the general conference. I'm, <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm pausing like the, to see if you want me to get you there or not. Yeah, I, I'm just like, <laughs> this is not where I thought your story was going to go. No, like, and not. this is why I love these podcasts is because mm. I do genuinely try to come with the least amount of knowledge about mm -hmm, people as I can mm -hmm. because I love exploring it yeah. and learning your story just like everybody else is. Um, and sometimes people kind of surprise me. And you did. You oh, just wow. surprised me because I don't think I was going to think counting. For, although, I don't know. Maybe. You seem like you oh, might be able on. to go into accounting. Is that a good thing or a bad I thing? I don't know. It depends <laughs> on how you look at it. <laughs> I worked in accounting for three years. It was not for my personality yes, at all. <laughs> I would agree. You're a little too much of an extrovert. People don't understand this about me because I'm a pastor, but I have a lot of introversion. And so that's kind of where the accounting most people from. don't know i'm not an extrovert oh well i'm an introvert of sorts <laughs> all right i'm an ambivert <laughs> is what they call it so introverted extrovert I, i've heard different um, things i i recharge by myself i don't okay. like big crowds i don't like big groups i can stand on a stage and i could present to a thousand people yeah um and I'd rather do that than to have to like actually be interacting nonstop mm, with a mm. lot of people. But I have to go back at the end of the night to a hotel room without anybody. Um, when we went to GC session last, mm -hmm. last time, it was my first time working a GC session. My whole family was going to come. I was like, no. Mm. I was like, I know I'm just going to want time at the end of the night. And I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to tell. I don't want anyone to yeah. ask me, how did your day go? No, it's I like, don't it. ask me. I get it. Um, but yeah, no, it's a... It, it wasn't for my personality, though. I, I I would definitely agree. It was my compassionate part of me that struggled <clears> with accounting because <throat> I worked in schools. And I didn't like telling people, you don't have enough money to send your children Oh, well, that's here. a difference. That was situation. a very, I just couldn't do it. I, I did actually like the, like, finding the three cents I was off after, like, you know, right. two hours. It was something so exciting. Yeah. It was like, I felt like it was like winning. I Yes. I solved the problem. Yes. Um, that, anyways, so do you go into accounting from here? I do. So let me pause because in my senior year of, well, I went five years because by switching mm -hmm. out of engineering, I had to pick up additional. Um, but in my last year of college at Ohio State, I was 22 years old. And it, uh, I, it was November of 93, if you want to know what it was. And I, um, you know, when I was, I told you that my parents were Adventist and they left the church, threw out all their little red books, which for our viewers, that's all the Ellen White books. Um, back when they were red. Back when they, were, they used to all be red. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, you know, and, and they got rid of their, you know, Adventist lifestyle and that kind of thing. It was so... But I always, in, in growing up, always still claimed to be a Christian. Um, I would, if pressed on it, not that anybody pressed me on it, <laughs> but if I pressed myself on it, I would consider myself a Methodist. This is what, in my own brain, I was a Methodist. Why Methodism? Because in my mind, I never stepped in a Methodist church once. I didn't know what a Methodist was, other than I thought that was like an average Christian. 
So in my mind, I was like a Methodist. Okay. So, so this is, I'm just telling you. You're an average Christian. I'm just an so average. Just like, so this is what I'm telling myself. Okay. I don't know the first thing about the Bible though. So I know my friends. Uh, I've got one friend who's Christian. He's Christian home, but I mean, obviously not living a Christian life. Um, but my other friends were atheist. And we would get in discussions late at night. You can imagine we were not clear minded. And we would get in discussions about whether or not there was a God. And I always would defend that there was a God. My reason for thinking there was a God that I would share is that I believe that we were all essentially good people, which of course the Bible says something very different than that. But what I was not realizing was that the voice of conscience was the voice of Christ that really had been speaking to me. Um, in other words, I thought that people were naturally what, what actually was the Spirit of God, um, you know, uh, pleading inside. But anyway, bottom line is, I had this nervousness, though, that I never wanted them or anyone to start questioning me or asking me for reasons for why I was a Christian or why I, because I didn't know a single verse in the Bible. Like I didn't know anything. Don't ask me. I am, but don't ask and, me. And you know, I did not like being embarrassed or in any way, like I was a people pleaser. I didn't want to be put into a situation where I was embarrassed or anything. So I always had in my mind that at some point I need to read a little bit of the Bible to just be able to I, defend myself. So I actually want to explore this for a second. Okay. So you're a people pleaser. Oh yeah. But you're standing up for Christianity mm -hmm. a not against, but like two atheists, which uh, there was no risk in that. We were just, we were just shooting the breeze. You know what I mean? It was just we weren't. I wasn't standing up for God or anything. we were drinking while we were doing it. You know what I mean? It was, <laughs> it was not like a. It was a just more like existential. Stand. Yeah. Thought. Okay. It was all I was, like, I was like, you know, it just seems a little bit no, odd. But it's more of these it existential yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, conversations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. Is there a God? Is there not a God? You know, it was. There was no tie to my life that had to be there at all, you know. Got it. So anyway, but I wanted still always in my mind to have something to be able to say so that I'm not embarrassed if I ever get questioned on this. Um, and I, I do have to bring up one other thing that came up in my growing up years before college was that my older brother, Dan, did go to Adventist schools. He was nine years older. He did go through Adventist schools. He was much older when my parents left the church, so he had had more Adventism. And I remember him coming t from Ohio to Missouri at holidays or whatever. I remember one night specifically, we had been drinking, <laughs> which was usually the case, <laughs> and we got talking about God. And because see, drinking is bad, 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 but what it does is it lowers a person's, this person's inhibitions and they start talking about all sorts of things they wouldn't normally talk about, right? So that's why this seems to be happening <laughs> when <laughs> this is my state. But my brother said, you know, I believe that God gives everybody a chance to accept him, that he won't, no one will be lost without having a chance to accept him. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that and thinking, is this my chance? Like, is this conversation my chance? So I had very few times when I was younger where I actually had like conviction. But I remember a couple of times where like that was one specific where I had conviction. But that's, I don't know that that's really what led me to do this, but let me just get back now to, um, I've Your in Ohio year. State, my senior year or my last year. And I decided, you know, I've now left all this group of friends I'm now hanging out with my brother's friends on the softball team, you know, at sports bars and things like that, but it's not my friends. And I'm feeling kind of cut off a little bit. I'm cut off from my friends. I don't really fully fit in with where I'm at. I'm just kind of existing. And I start thinking, you know, maybe I should do that that I always thought about doing, read a little bit of the Bible so that I'm able to answer that question if somebody asks me. And I'm a list maker, so I even wrote it on my list of things to do. It was like, you know, do your laundry, do the such and such homework, read, read the Bible. From the Bible. <laughs> right. It was right there on my list of things to do. Check. Typical check checklist thing that we don't like to talk about or don't like to encourage as the reason to read your Bible. But I, in November of 1993, in my basement of my parents' home, opened my Bible and just began to read 
And do you know where you started? I don't. It was in the New Testament. I was struck with eternal reality. The Lord revealed himself to me, totally changed my worldview, totally changed my life. I had not actually made changes in my life yet, but it was like putting on glasses. I just was blown away. I went up to talk to my dad and was like, dad, if this is all true, what are we all doing here? Like, nobody's talking about this. This is, you know, like I could not understand that these eternal realities were not s the most important thing to everybody in the world. How long did it take you to go? I mean, you didn't go down there for 20 minutes and read and I don't have this epiphany. No, Alyssa, because my memory <laughs> is not great. Okay. But I can tell you that over a few weeks, I was reading my, I was starving for reading the Bible. Like I, I was supposed to be studying for finals and I was reading Galatians, you know, like I was unable to pull myself out of it. And it made such an impact on my dad and my mother. They were like, you know, my dad told my brother, I have a, an older brother who's a pastor now. And, uh, you know, back then he wasn't, neither one of us were converted. And my dad told my brother, have you heard about Jim? He's been reading his Bible. <laughs> And my brother said, Jim, Jim doesn't have a religious bone in his body. You know, that was his response. When my best friend from Missouri called, my dad got the phone and dad started telling him about me reading the Bible. So when I take the phone, the first thing he says to me is, so I heard you found Jesus. And I said, well, yeah, I've been reading my Bible. Yeah. And he was like, whoa, like he, he was kidding with me because he thought, <laughs> but I was actually serious about what I'd been reading. And so, yeah, just within a few weeks, I'm, it just had a total transformation in my life. There are some other events I could go into, but it wasn't from an evangelistic meeting, which I support. It wasn't from somebody giving me a Bible study, which I definitely support. Not a small group. It wasn't a small group. Nobody. It was just me and the Bible and the Lord I, this is why I have such confidence in the power of the Bible, because just the word itself totally changed my worldview and, and, and my thinking. And I wasn't even like rock bottom. I mean, I had problems in my life and loneliness and a lot of things like that. But it wasn't like I was rock bottom or anything. I just was in a position where the Lord totally revealed himself to me. And of course, I was always a people pleaser. And this was a corrective to that because I recognize now that I worked so hard to try to, and I didn't have to work that way for the Lord. And it broke, it just broke my heart. You know, I think it's, I actually love this story. I love that it was just you and the word of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of young adults, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I kind of am speaking to those, those of us who are parents, you and I are both in this mm -hmm. kind of position where we have young adult children who are in college mm -hmm. and I, I talk to so many of my friends and my family and it's just kind of like we see our children kind of struggling yeah, and trying to figure out who they are right. in the world right now. And where does, does religion matter? You know, and even if it, if, even if it's real, does it matter to them? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I love the, I'm going to call almost the promise mm -hmm. that is within this story that if we just open the word of Come God, honestly to the Bible, God mm -hmm. wants nothing more than to reveal himself mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. And I think for so many young people, they have not had conversion experiences. Mm -hmm. They've maybe they didn't go off drinking, you sure. know, doing all the partying, whatever. But I think most of us just did not have authentic conversion experiences. And so we go through this, this state of life and, if all we do is open the word of God, God wants desperately to speak to us. Mm -hmm. And it's totally shown in your story mm -hmm. because you didn't have some like masterful teacher right. that was like, you know, it's not like Mark Finley's taking you through right. the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you have these Bible study guides mm -hmm. that are like, let me break down salvation mm -hmm. for you. It's just in the word of yep. God. The love of God is so mm -hmm obvious it, it can permeate the very being and it was so honest like you know the bible speaks to a person's heart in a way that you don't get in the world 
it just has, it cuts right through all of even your own facade. You know, it's just everything about it is just very direct, honest, and you can, you just, the ring of truth is in it. You know, you just yeah. know it. And it, and it, and it's personal in the sense that I, it wasn't just that I had these ideas now. I saw the Lord, like he revealed himself to me, you know, and that, it just, totally changed me. My life still needed to have some work. A few course corrections, uh -huh. but that's nothing that the word of God that's can't right. help with. That's right. So uh, actually, I'm going to cling to that story. I, mm -hmm. That's actually, it's beautiful what the living word of God mm -hmm. can do mm -hmm. to a human heart. Um. So you graduate, you've had this I'm going to call it your conversion experience. This yes. is where God has mm -hmm. called you. And at some point you say, here I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do you do with your degree? Mm -hmm. You go into accounting. Yay! So I graduated <laughs> with my accounting degree. Um, right at that time, I, you know, right after my conversion, very fascinatingly, two of my brothers were converted at the same time through totally different circumstances to me. So my grandmother had died and she was special to all of us, but two of my brothers, uh, they were especially impacted by the death of my grandmother. Um, one brother in specific ties his testimony to being in her room as she was on a hospice and, and wanting to share something with her from the Bible to make sure she was in heaven because she was not a Christian but she was a loving woman and he couldn't come up with anything. He didn't, he didn't know. And it deeply impacted him that he didn't know. And so, you know, he went through that experience. I had another brother who's deeply impacted from the loss of my grandma. Anyway, so me and two of my brothers have these sort of independent conversion experiences and talk to my dad and say, take us to church. Now he had left church, but he still believed the seventh day was the Sabbath. So he took us to the nearest church and we, you know, began to attend there. And it was there that I ended up, um, well, it was through a Bible study that I had there that ended up meeting my soon to be wife. So that was around that time. Um, <laughs> I love this part of the story. We're gonna have to definitely come back to that. Well, <laughs> it would be too long. <laughs> and then, uh, but what ended up happening with me, I ended up, you know, in my last, couple of semesters, I had internships and I had one at a public accounting firm, KPMG Pete Marwick. And the other one was at a corporate business called Worthington Industries, not to be confused with the Adventist Worthington Foods, but the same town. It's, it's right. It's a suburb of Columbus. And so I ended up, they both offered me a job. I ended up working at Worthington as a corporate accountant. I worked there, uh, as I ministered in the church. Now, there's a lot of development in my church life. I'll put that on pause for a minute and just say that I continued in my professional life there um, for about 12 years. And I was a controller of a couple of manufacturing plants uh, for Worthington Cylinder Corporation. Um, Jim, I see you as someone who's kind of young. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I know that you have ministry still in your life, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out like, so while like, this I is was, like crazy to me because I'm like, why 12 I years, how is that even possible? So about nine, eight and a half years into it, um, I was very active in the local church during this time. It changed the way that I, my career was because I wasn't the guy who stayed late every night, whatever. I mean, I stayed, you know reasonably late but i didn't See as late as you but i wasn't <laughs> ladder climbing there at all i was wanting to be involved in the church so i was very active in the church i mean in that time in the local church as a lay person now, is this ohio yes you were in, in ohio right? okay. um a couple different places in ohio but westerville ohio is a good portion of the time but these are worthington westerville are suburbs of columbus and i was a sabbath school teacher i was a personal ministries leader i was a church board chairman a finance committee chairman uh Basically, you name it, I was involved in the local church level. Um, and I eventually started preaching at a lot of, you know, I would get invited to preach here or there just as a layperson. And it was during that time that the Ohio Conference started to, uh, for about 40% of their churches, they started to um, 
higher bivocational pastors. Okay, so about 40% of the churches. And That's a lot. It's a lot. It's all, all of the smaller, more rural churches, but there's a lot of that in Ohio. Um, so at any rate, there was a particular church that was without a pastor, and they were asking me to come speak once a month while they were without a pastor. And every time I went there to speak, they would ask me to be the pastor. And I didn't know that I wanted to do that. And I knew that I didn't want to ask my wife if she wanted to do that. Um, you know, she didn't marry a pastor. Spoiler alert, you get married. We do. We were already <laughs> we were already married at that time. But, you know, she didn't marry a pastor. And, it, you know, I just knew this was, you know, like if I take this, what will that mean? Will it mean that eventually I'll get into full-time ministry? Oh, it's just so many questions in my mind. Plus, I, I knew that once I became a pastor, it would probably mean moving. And I was very homebound. Like, I'm very attached to my family and all that kind of thing. So I never wanted to leave home. I had, at that point, we had two little girls. They would see grandma every weekend. I mean, they, she was right down the street. You know, all my brothers and cousins, I all lived in the same territory. Like, I didn't want to go anywhere. So I was a little nervous about that. So I was nervous where it was all going to lead. But I ended up from their persistence and then talking to my wife, um, we decided that I would go ahead and offer to be a bivocational pastor. So I would continue doing my job, but I would preach every Sabbath, baptize, communion, whatever, do visitation when I could. Um, and so that's what I did. I became a bivocational pastor and I was doing that for about three and a half years in Ohio. So I want to come back to your wife at some point, but I want to talk about, <laughs> <sighs> I feel bad because I'm like, not sure how we're going to get back to We're definitely going to run out of time, but go ahead. And <laughs> you're like, oh. Um, actually, you guys are adorable. Um, oh, well, thank you. What is it like to be a bivocational pastor? I want to explore that a bit mm. because it, it's something that we don't really hear a lot about. But I understand. I, I've, I'm going through pastoral ministry, my mm -hmm. master's in pastoral ministry mm -hmm. right now. And so I'm speaking with all these other people who are pastors. I'm mm -hmm. one of like three people who's like getting the degree who's not currently, not currently in pastoring. Pastor. Mm -hmm. um, pastoring is hard on its own. It is. Um, it's a, it's a, it's more than just a calling. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you do both? How do you keep up with this other job? I mean, I get that maybe you can't do full-time visitation stuff, but you still have to preach a sermon at the end of every week. Mm -hmm. So you're still going to have to make time for that sermon prep. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to, if someone's in the hospital, you're going to probably try mm -hmm. to find a way to get there. How mm -hmm. do you, how do you juggle all of mm -hmm. that? Yeah, it wasn't simple, but I was, I mean, I loved what I was doing. So you know, I was already a super active lay person. And sometimes we forget that lay people, you know, this is, I, I still work in Sabbath school and person ministry to this day, which is, is a direct connection to the work of the laity. And I can do that because I was a lay person for quite some time in active work in the church. And then I became a bivocational pastor. And I do see the lay people themselves, like to have Bible studies every week, to be going to prayer meeting, to be preparing for Sabbath school, to be doing all That's these true. things. That's true. There's a lot of work that we call on our lay people to do with their full time jobs. And so it wasn't a huge shift. My, the nature of my work did change, uh, but the quantity was not a significant. It was a little bit of increase, but not a significant increase. But it's a lot of work, obviously. And, you know, pastors are asked to do a lot of different things perfectly. And, you know, you, you end up at the end of the day, you know, trying to balance it in a way that you can manage all the things that are most highest priority. But yeah, it's not an easy task, but the, you know, when you have a burden for it. That's an interesting point because you're right. I've, <laughs> I've been a pathfinder director and that almost feels like yeah, a full-time right? job. <laughs> I mean, we forget our, some of our lay it's leaders. True. I, I don't even think I had thought mm -hmm. of it. I mean, there is a different kind of level of spiritual responsibility yeah, that a pastor sure. has. But, for sure. But you're right. We I think we don't think through the yeah. the sacrifice and the hard work that often our, our lay people yeah. are going through. Yeah. Okay. Just how do you meet her? Oh, okay. I, I'm going to have to hear the story Just, here. I'll give you the brief version. Uh, my wife was not Adventist. I was not a baptized Adventist myself, but I had I had asked my dad. Remember, we'd asked our mm -hmm. dad to take us to this church, and we met somebody who was having a Bible study. They were going through Steps to Christ, actually. 
And they had different neighbors who were not Adventists who were coming to this as well. And among those neighbors who were not Adventist was somebody who knew my wife, who was not at that time my wife. And, okay, I have to be honest here. So, although my wife, you know, loved the Lord and what have you, she was also looking for someone, you know, in, open to finding someone. And so this friend saw me at the Bible study, knew me, and recommended to my wife that she come to this Bible study. You know, <laughs> there, is, there are worse the things. The there are some worse thing, <laughs> ways to have gotten your spouse. I Actually, I think it's kind of... So, <laughs> yes, she came. It was a, There's a little bit of a side story because there was another James there who ended up taking an interest in her. Wrong James. Wrong, Wrong James. James. And we had to wait for that to kind of fizzle out a little bit because I didn't want and then eventually yeah we began to get to wrong know each James. other it was the wrong James <laughs> poor James poor James <laughs> sorry James whoever's out him, there if you a... hear this James we're sorry he's but got... the right guy got the girl he has um, another wife that he loves very much okay. right now so that's, that's good well that's good <laughs> <laughs> so you get married I know you have two daughters yes um you go into bivocational pastoring yes at what point do you just accept yeah, it's this time to is grow my calling. All the way. So while I was pastoring by vocational, you know, I, there, I, you meet people in different ways. And I started getting some feelers, some invitations to get into full time ministry. Um, a friend from British Columbia who had been in Ohio and was now in administration in British Columbia called me, wanted to know if I'd want to come out and be pastor of such and such a church. I thought, oh, that's too far. I I don't want to do that. I'm not, I don't feel ready. Whatever. I said, no, I don't think so. Then the next thing, I get a call from somebody from Oklahoma. They want me to come and pastor a church in Oklahoma. And it's not the, it's not the administration. It's just a very influential lay person who, <laughs> you know, says that he would like me to consider coming. So at that point, I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. We'll see what happens. About a month later, things are moving along, and the conference secretary calls me. He says he like he wants to fly out and talk to me and this and that. So now I'm really stressed out. <laughs> so I get on my knees. Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma. <laughs> well, it's it's. Remember, it's far away from family. I, there's well, it's and, Oklahoma. Well, I know to all y'all who like Oklahoma. I'm sorry, but, but I was from Texas. So. Yeah, <laughs> but it was also warm, and my wife, if we went anywhere, would prefer warm, warm over to cold. Cold. Okay, <laughs> so you know there was that, and there was a promise of being able to fly us back frequently to see family, and all all sorts of things were connected to this. So they it made it very appealing, and I'm like. I got on my knees one morning and I just prayed and said, Lord, I have to know. Like, if you want me to do this, not like if you want me to do this ever, but if you want me to do this now for this call, I need to know. You need to make it clear to me because I, I do not see it. I'm just, I need it to be clear. So I really pleaded with him one morning. And then that evening I was preparing for a sermon. The sermon was called Fishing in the Daytime. And I was reading about, you know, the story of, the disciples trying to catch fish and they caught nothing. And then Jesus mm -hmm. said, cast your net on the other side, right? And in the context of that chapter I'm reading, it says, at this point, the disciples had not fully left their former employment. And my antenna perks up immediately because that's my exact situation. I've not fully left my former employment. And then she goes on to say that now he was calling them to unite their interests fully with him. And I knew that the Lord was answering my prayer. She went on to say that the reason that he provided all that fish was to prove that he would provide for them. I didn't mention that aside from family, the other big hindrance for me was I was going to probably have to take about a 50% pay cut. You know, I mean, I was yeah. doing pretty well in my career. And so this was a way that he was proving to the disciples that he would provide for them. So now it was time to cut off from the former employment and to unite their interests fully with him. And I heard clearly that was an answer to prayer and I made my mind up that I would do it. About a week goes by, I don't hear from the secretary and eventually that call ended up falling through. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, 
what was this about? You know, I went through this. You're like, I had this William this Miller <laughs> experience running out and <laughs> surrendering. And, and But two weeks later, I got a call from the Michigan conference and they wanted me to you mean come. where it's cold. That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> The, it's almost the exact opposite. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we did end up taking that call, and we went up to to uh, minister in northern Michigan of all places. So not even like not the bottom even, part. We're no. gonna get as close. Well, it as we wasn't can for you. the Upper Peninsula. That was one of the <laughs> options. We were like, ah, uh, but all but, right. So like, right? Which hand is the? Which so hand is it would be up here. Oh, you're like at the top of the finger here. Yeah, right? Alpena and Onaway. So right up by the bridge is like. Uh, Petoskey and Sheboygan. But it was, so for it was those of you who are like watching us and seeing us put up our hands, the yeah, state the of mitt. Michigan is considered like a mitt. Mm -hmm. And so we like, whenever we want to know where people are in Michigan, you know, like Andrews is down here. Right, and, right. Yeah. Um, so you, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I kind okay. of find it humorous that you end up like. I know. <laughs> it wasn't humorous to my wife, <laughs> but in the end, it was a blessing. So. All right. So you serve Michigan. How many churches do you pastor during your time so I, in there? So in Michigan, I pastored two churches up in northern Michigan for a couple of years. Things went really well up there and uh, had a lot of good experiences. Had the privilege of um, working with a non-denominational pastor who um, converted to Adventism and uh, just had wonderful people that we grew close to and everything else. But it was too short. It was cut cut short. They really wanted me to come and pastor in the Detroit area in one of their uh, key congregations in Detroit called the Detroit, Detroit Metro Church. So I pastored there. They added a church to it uh, called South Lion. Then they had me plant a church. So I had three churches there. And uh, But I was also the district superintendent. So I was coordinating some of the evangelistic work for the whole city. And then after doing that for several years, uh, they invited me to the conference office to serve as the evangelism coordinator for the conference and the personal ministries director. Um, and I was doing that for a little over a couple of years before I came to the general conference. So did you get your master's? Yeah, believe it or not, I'm right now finalizing my master's. It was a condition of me being here at the GC was uh, getting by the way, you know, if I had gone through the normal route, I would have just gotten it when I was young and whatever. Yeah. But, but I had a, you know. So I'd, you work in your MDiv? It is a Master of Ministry at Southern. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so we're actually both working on our Master's. Yeah. That's yeah. Kind of, I did not know that. I'm almost done. Yeah, no, I'm it. like, I am kind of feel like I'm just at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have like another two and a half years oh, to okay. go in I'm mine. sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, you know that. All right. So we're going to tangent a little here. What was your favorite class that you've taken so far? That's a really good question. I really like studies in Romans. Um, I, you know, mine was in church leadership. So there was, you know, I, I liked the theology side, the hermeneutics and studies in Romans, what have you. Uh, but there was some interesting, there was a couple of business courses they had us take too, which, you know, was just uh, some of that was a refresher for me because I had my bachelor's in accounting. So, um, but so the, those were helpful too. Are they all online or do you actually go down there? I go finish? down there for in the summer and I do them online. Yeah. Both. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, so, you know, I struggle with trying to pick my favorite class because every semester I take a new class. And then I fall in love with that. Uh -huh. That's what happens. <laughs> so right now I have two classes that have kind of like, like mm -hmm. um, Rohilu Pakini taught one on intergenerational ministry. Mm. And it changed a lot of my thought pattern. But I will say um, I just took one from Dr. Davidson, Richard Davidson. Mm -hmm. And it was on the doctrine of the sanctuary. Yeah. And I grew up an Adventist. Mm -hmm. I'm like, fourth, fifth generation of us. I need to actually ask my parents because I thought it was fourth and then somebody said something recently. I thought it was all of a made me think I might have been fifth, but it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I really, I was scared of the judgment. I'm scared. Like mm. the whole thing is just kind of like, you know, yeah. it's just one of those things we don't want to yeah. talk about. And when we got done with his class for the first time, I felt like I could say like with David, like, mm. you know, judge me, oh Lord. It was mm. just the most beautifully restorative class Praise helped me fall in love with our savior which 
me and my therapist had a whole conversation. <laughs> she, I I don't mean to. She just like gets like all of my like random uh, thoughts. And so it, the poor lady had to listen to me for a half an hour talk about the doctrine <laughs> of the sanctuary. Um, anyways, this isn't about me and my therapist, well, but it's a brilliant thing. It's personal ministries. It's the, personal the ministries. The good Jim. news <laughs> of the judgment is that God is good. Amen. I mean, you really, that comes out in the judgment. So... <sighs> You do not have a master's. You're, you've come through a very roundabout sort of way. What am I doing here? That, Is that what you're gonna I know me? why you're here. <laughs> I know why you're here. Oh, okay. Because I see how God is working through you now. Oh, amen. So I don't question why you're here. What I wonder is, how did you get the call and what did you think when you got it? Okay, so <clears throat> things were going well when I was... Uh, at the conference level in Michigan. We had done some union-wide evangelistic meetings that I had coordinated, uh, and it was really, really uh, a blessing for the whole thing. And then we created a Bible study ministry that um, that we rolled out through all the churches, and some of these things were, um, were getting a lot of traction. And so I had, I had already heard about a couple of people who had, when there were certain openings that came over the GC, they they brought up my name. They, they would tell me this. And I'd be like, okay, but that's <laughs> that's <silly>. not reality. <laughs> and so, and then I actually got that confirmed once where one of them said, yeah, I actually went back and talked to them. They said, they that wouldn't work because, you know, you don't have your master's or whatever. And so I told my wife this and I said, oh, honey, good news. <laughs> <laughs> good news. There's We're not no going way, to the GC. There's no way that we could that we could go to the GC because I wouldn't meet the education requirement or whatever. And so, because I was in the middle of something, producing some things and involved in ministries that I was passionate about and that was moving and I was excited about, and I didn't really want to do anything else. Um, so I, it was kind of a relieving thing to me to hear that. And then shortly after that, I got a call from the director at the time of the Who department, was the director? Ramon Canals. Okay. And he's asked me if I would like to put my name on a list. Uh, like, no, because I, I, I don't have a degree. <laughs> I said, I'll think about it. I said, I'll, I'll think about it and get back to you. Can I think about this and get back to you? So I took some time to consult um, with different individuals. And then I made up my mind that, no, it seemed like the direction I, I had moved into the conference office. There was the possibility of, you know, um, administration role or something. And I just thought maybe that's the direction that I need to go. That was what I was being counseled with, at least by one highly respected individual. And so I decided to tell him, and time is not good, and I just I just don't think so. So I did. I called him, told him. No. He said, well, you know, sometimes when I'm unsure about something, I'll just, or, or just to know for sure that it's the Lord's will, I'll just let them put my name on the list and then just see how <laughs> everything He's unfolds. like, really, just put your name on those lists. So I said, look, if you want to put my name on the list, <clears throat> fine. I'm just telling you now that I'm not sensing that that's the direction that the Lord is, is moving. And so I, I, I wouldn't be open to it at this point. I said, okay, we'll put your name on the list. A few weeks later, he calls me and he's telling me basically that he's Remember talked that to this person, this person, this person, this <laughs> person, and we want to bring your name to the uh, administrative committee. So I was somewhat blown away. I said, okay, well, we can't do that yet. My wife and I flew over uh, from Michigan to the GC to interview and to see the area and all that. After the first day, my wife said, um, I'm just not sure. You know, she, she was really struggling with it. That's probably a light way of saying it. She was not inclined at the moment uh, to, to do it. And I got up the next morning, I'm like, Lord, I'm unsure, but my wife's definitely unsure. You know, if this is going to work, I need her support and I need to be clear. So, you know, really help us. And that second day we were here, um, the Lord made things very clear. I won't go into the story, but even though it was not necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily have moved here for our family's sake or for the area or whatever, not that we, you know, have significant problems with the area, but it's a lot more uh, urban than, mm -hmm. you know, the traffic and all that kind of thing. It's not what we would ideally want. Um, but we definitely sensed that the Lord had been preparing me um, experience-wise for the things that I would be called to do here and that I would be given a lot of uh, opportunity to do the very things that I would feel uh, passionate about doing. So the bottom line is 
um, I ended up saying, okay, you know, if you want to take my name, but you know, that was in the committee's hands, of course, they don't normally hire an associate, uh, who does not have a uh, master's in some type of theology, but they listened to the experience argument and all those things, as I understand, and, um, uh, said that if I would get my master's while I was doing it, that they would approve it. So that's how it happened. Well, I'm glad that you came. Well, I'm glad I'm here. Um, and I've loved hearing your story. Actually, there's so much of like little things in your story that resonates so much with me. And there's mm. certain parts of your story that I know are going to make me a better mother. Mm. Um, and and a better worker mm. in the church and just overall understand how god works in my own life better mm, so i just yeah. i want to thank you for that it's a it's always wonderful just to have people share their stories and to open up and and to hear how god leads because you did not come the typical route there's mm, so yeah. many things like that unless it was the hand of God, there's no reason why you right. and I should be sitting at this table together, either of us. I believe that. But God wanted us here, serving his church at this time. Mm -hmm. And I know you're humbled by that. I know that you, you work and pray for for those lay members, because that's really your area. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. Sabbath School Personal Mysteries, that's really about the lay people. Mm -hmm. It's right. how do we help them fall in love with God? How do we help them love his church? And how do we help them share that love right. with others? And you do such a good job mm. of demonstrating that, coming up with creative new initiatives. Um, I know that you and Ramon, I know he's moved on to ministerial and now you've, you've graduated. <laughs> we still work together Do we closely. call it graduated to yeah. his role um, as director? But I know that you now... Um, you know, working together on this global, mm -hmm. global disciple making evangelism. Yes. Did I get that right? You All got the wording. It. You, wording? Got it. you know, so you, you, God has given you this ability to cr think creatively, mm. to think globally, and to think strategically. Mm. Um, but more than that, to cast a vision mm. for how God can use his, his lay church members. Mm to proclaim the good news. Amen. So thank you so much for being used. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. I really, really have appreciated this time we've had together. Thank you, Alyssa. You've been a good interviewer. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of a &N Profiles with our guest, Jim Howard. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel wherever you're tuning in today so you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with us and join us next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.